we're now going to go to education and we've got back uh, Alwyn Paul. Good afternoon, Alwyn. Hello, Rodney. How are you? I'm excellent. What I would like, I know we've had you on before and you've explained why you know a lot about education. There'll be new listeners. Could you just give us two or three minutes about why you know a little bit about education? Well, I, I guess uh, the first one is I've been doing it for a while. Now, uh, I, I, when you look out from inside, I, I still consider myself very young, um, but I have been uh, working as a teacher, educator since uh, 1991. Um, in, in various roles from Tauranga Boys, Hamilton Boys, St Cuthbert's, to designing a, a middle school model and, and putting that in place as a Mount Hobson Middle School, which is now Mount Hobson Academy, uh, taking that model uh, through very good staff to South Auckland Middle School and Middle School East Auckland, and uh, you know doing continual um, research uh, to and listening to people really. Uh, which which has it had a phenomenal uh, impact just this week that I can sort of tell you about as we go. Yes, um, and and as um, I said last time I was on, I, I don't consider you know I've worked a day in my life. It's 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 a passion, and I also said you you don't always get it right, and I, I think that's something that at times we don't acknowledge very well. Uh, in education, and to some degree, I think that's led us as a nation into a little bit of a hole. Well, a little bit of a hole. <laughs> a big hole. <laughs> a deep crater. Um, but again, going back to the event that I'll, that, you know, we'll talk about. Um, well, Lee, before I, we do I'll, that event, Alwyn, yep. Um, yep. you are fantastic at getting the data on school mm -hmm. performance, yeah. analyzing that data, presenting that data, and in so many ways, it's deeply shocking and actually at the same time encouraging mm -hmm. because a lot of canards that get bandied around aren't true. Yeah. And I would like you, first of all, in the first part of this interview, to tell us yep. about the data that you have and what mm -hmm. it tells us, and then we'll go into your policy conclusions and the meeting that you've just had. Does that sound a reasonable way of going? Yep, sounds perfect. Tell so us we, about we, that got data. About, we, we've got about six hours, haven't we? Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, okay, so... Um, uh, within the Ministry of Education is a, is a really good group, group of people who work, did you hear me actually say that, Rodney? I put those two things together. Yes. Who work in, in a little branch called Education Counts. And they do just the most amazing job, um, you know, putting together data sets. So, so you can go on there and you can say, oh, look, I'm interested in this particular school. And, and you can look up and you can get some good information from it. Um, what what they uh, don't do, which they've been really happy to help me to do, is to then, you know, kind of put all that data together and combine it with a range of other things to get a um, big picture view, but also a school by school view for every high school in New Zealand. Now, Clearly, when you do that, it will show up problems and it, it, it will show up uh, cold spots, if you like, and, and things that need to be improved. Um, but one of the great benefits from doing it also is that you see the you see the bright spots. And, and as I've written and, and spoken a few times, you know, you, you, you discover the schools that everyone should beat a pathway to. So what I do with the data, um, most people will hear about... Um, uh, NCEA and university entrance results uh, in around February, March, um, and that's what is co called cohort results. 
uh, or, or their role-based results. And, and what that uh, does, it's important, uh, it talks to the achievements of a, a particular school or a set of schools for the students who were in year 11, year 12 and year 13 for that year. But what it doesn't do, and it takes a lot longer for this data to become available, um, it doesn't it doesn't take a big picture view of what has happened to the students who originally enrolled there because some schools are, you know, there are schools who retain pretty much all of their students through 17 years of age. There are others that are by year 13 have only got around 50% of their students and some even less. And so you get this much better picture of of how a school's doing. Now, uh, so the measures that I have, uh, obviously, is, is um, looking at school size, and then we do level three plus and university entrance. Um, I've got a comparison by decile, um, which is useful. Um, a comparison between, is so, so is there a gap? So some schools, they're so, I would say, well-focused, that there's very little gap between the level three and UE. Now, this already sounds complex. It, it, it's, it's relatively uh, simple in that uh, to get your university entrance, which is, the to me, the top New Zealand school qualification, there's, there's no harm in getting it. It's not like, oh, my goodness. Uh, and to get into trades and things like that, and, and good employment, to have that as your top school qualification is really helpful. Um, as well as its obvious use. You, you need to do three of what are called accredited subjects at year 13. And, and some people will think, you know, oh, that's a narrow band and, and some kids don't, don't suit the academic subjects and all that sort of stuff. It's not a narrow band at all. It's actually really broad. It includes Māori, Samoan, uh, I think Tongan, uh, different sciences, it, it, it's probably about 30 subjects. Um, and and it's, it's relatively easy to channel kids through into that, but some schools simply don't do it. They sort of pre-prescribe their kids as not having that ability. Or they don't explain it well enough, um, and, and particularly to parents, etc. cetera. Um, I also look at retention. Um, does the school... Uh, keep its students uh, through until 17 years of age, which uh, John Hattie, the great sort of New Zealand educationist, would say is is probably the biggest correlation to success. Keep them in school. Um, now, they're more likely to stay if the school is doing a good job and they're interested in school. Um, I also look at um, their pathway. Where do they go? Um, so, for instance, how many of the, the leavers from that school are going into uh, degree level study? Um, and then there are some measures. So, for instance, uh, um, it, it's, it's becoming pretty obvious that, if it's not already, that, that we have a, a, a severe attendance problem. Um, I, I don't know what goes beyond crisis, but in term one of this year, for instance, the data shows that in decile one schools, only 22% of students are fully attending. And, what and is, what's the definition of fully attending, Owen? A, a, a fully attending, or fully attending is nine days uh, out of 10. Um, and in a, in a sense that, that hides it, you know, Mr. Hipkins was in Parliament a couple of weeks ago, they're almost trying to say that's a tough measure. Well, goodness. Um, and, and again, international comparisons of New Zealand's attendance has us behind um, every one of the countries that we would think that we are comparable to. And, and for instance, with the UK just miles behind. Um, and we've always had the sense, and, and I, I guess it came out of the, the late 70s, uh, that you know New Zealand was uh, a remarkable country for education. And at that time, comparably, we were but at best we've stood still. And, and so the rest of the world has passed us by, but I'd say in the last five years, we haven't just stood still, 
um, things have gone into some significant decline, which is a worry. It, it should be the opposite. We should be getting better. So um, this data, yep. if I was listening to our show mm -hmm. and I wanted to see how my kid's school was performing yep. relative to other schools, is that yes. readily available to me through the ministry? No, it's available. It's available through me. Um, so, so to get it in this form, you'd have to do what I did and spend uh, a considerable amount of time. Um, so, what I tend to do just uh, just, is, just hold it there, Alwyn. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. But, um So, because the <laughs> ministry and the government don't like the idea of making available to taxpayers and to parents the relative performance of schools? Yeah, we have had, uh, I, I guess, a pretty strong tendency not to put out there what people call league tables. Um, and, and there are a couple of things we can we can do about that to kind of make it I guess more palatable even for the schools. Um, you see, the reason if I'm involved in, in teaching and learning with kids, the reason I get out of bed in the morning is because I have a very strong belief that they can improve, yes. that their learning can develop. Um, whereas if you're in a situation, and it can be, for instance, you consider that ability levels are fixed, which is a sort of psychobabble nonsense from about 30 years ago, uh, where you categorised um, people according to some form of fixed ability, um, which it's just nonsense. Um, or you will say that the um, hindrances in a particular child's life uh, are so strong, socioeconomic, family background, all this sort of stuff, that you know we're, we're pretty much wasting our time with that group. And, and again, that's nonsense. I mean, that's that's why state schools exist. And and the data shows very clearly with the, these bright spot examples that that's nonsense. Um, well, that's what. You know, so huge. there are two things that strike me about this data. The yeah. first one is the extraordinary variation across schools. So yes. I'm just glancing over it now. Some schools yep. are as low as, uh, this is amongst schools that have got a roll larger than, uh, with 75 levers or more, right? So correct. You're, yep. correct, you're on the big schools, so you don't get odd anomalies. Some schools yep. are down to about 15% of yep. kids are leaving with NCA level three or above. Yes. Other schools at 95 percent correct now that is extraordinary so just picture this listeners you've got a school here where 15 percent of the leavers are leaving without level three or above a school down the road is leaving with 95 percent or a little bit better a huge difference now, if someone had told me that, I would have said, oh, yeah, there are schools that are poor, living in poor parts of New Zealand, where the families are struggling and not great. And then there's your flash schools full of white privilege where everyone's happy and the parents have got lots of money and they're private schools and bright kids are going to those schools and they can do well. That's the canard, isn't it? Yep. Now, what your data shows, and you've graphed it by decile schools, and yep. each decile has that huge range. Oh, absolutely. There's, there's a slight there's a slight look at it 
uh, by correlation. Now, Desol 1, am I correct in saying a Desol 1 school is in what the Ministry and Statistics Department um, describe as a poorer area? They're the bottom 10% by income. That's right, roughly. So we yep. look at uh, Desol 1 schools, right, and they range from 25% to 85%. Mm-hmm. If we look at the Desol 10 schools, they range from 45 to 95%. Yep. So there are Desol 1 schools. And, and I'm sure... I'm sure. Sorry? <laughs> Carry on, yep. Alan. I was going to say, and I'm sure uh, that people can perceive that, that if you if you see that in, in your head, and, and so there are... Uh, 10 um, uh, columns uh, with the dots that represent uh, the the level that their levers are achieving at. Um, you know, you can take a pencil and, and, and let's say you went from uh, 70 and just penciled across and uh, I mean, uh, you would have to be happy to send your children to any one of those schools. Yes. Um, and they're in uh, all um, decile. They're in all decile areas. Absolutely. Which to and, me and my, is amazing. Yep. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, it, I think I think it's culture changing when we know that, because you go, oh, hang on a sec. If this decile one school or decile two school or decile three school, etc., if they can achieve. Why can't the others? And then the next thing is, well, they can. So how do we pathway that? Yes. Uh, and you know, how do we how, how do we get those schools that are well below that trend line um, up above it? You know, flip it. And, and I, I mean, I I think part of it is that we sit on our hands in our own schools and we, you know, we we focus on our own problems when when actually it'd be better to get in the car and go and find those schools. And um, you know, take off the the, the vision that, that that you noted before that the only success is occurring in high decile schools. It's simply not true. No, it's 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 amazingly presented here, and I mean there are decile yep. one schools, poor area schools that are performing better than fifty yep. percent of the schools in the decile ten areas. <laughs> Right, it, it is, and, I, and, and I, I did put out a little bit of a, a a little bit of a stir up on that the other day because I, I mean, I, I, I think a school like um, Macaulay High School in, in South Auckland, you know, I mean, I just, I, I am mean, going to go and see them, uh, and I am going to talk it through and say, look, what are you doing? Um, but I mean, there are others, uh, Manukau in, in Palmerston North is one that we highlighted last year, it's an exceptional school. Um, and it's pretty much all Māori children. Um, and you just like, again, why wouldn't you just go there and say, hey, look, Nathan, what are you doing? Uh, what's working? What can we copy? What can we emulate? Um, because we need to. Oh, it's just astonishing because it actually, the data, when you look at it, shows you that Something in these schools is overcoming every disadvantage that we would otherwise Great. expect that condemns these kids to not succeeding at school and in life. There are schools in the poorest areas that are exceeding, as I said, 50% of the schools in the rich areas that that uh -huh. means that there are things that schools can do. This is objective measure. <laughs> you know, like you're saying, this is an objective measure comparing apples with apples with apples. There are things that schools yep. are doing that are transforming kids' lives here, today, now. Correct. And, I, and if you do want to look at the other end, I, if I was a, a, a parent 
uh, in one of the DSR sort of seven, eight, nine, ten schools who are well down, you know, I'd, I'd be wandering along saying, mm, you know, what can we do about this? Yes. Um, and, and, and because that's a huge waste of talent as well. Of course. And, and a waste of developing ability. Of course. And, you know, um, John Hattie would often call these cruising schools. Um, and, yeah, and so, so you are saying as a parent, uh, how come we're not above the line there? Um, <laughs> So that this, uh, and I mean, this is the, the, the whole argument of state education is to have a level playing field. Yeah. And you're showing a variation, and let me repeat it, um, from 15% uh, levers having achieved to 95% over having achieved. And that, that's, you couldn't imagine a bigger variation if you tried, but no. the variation is more to do with the school than the environment or the socioeconomics of the family because there are decile one schools, the poor schools, achieving above the rich schools and that's where we come now to this conference that you've been at. Now, let's talk about that for us, please. Yeah, I, I guess the final thing on the data too. So um, I, I make it available two ways. For people who are using it in a professional way, um, they can they can contact me through uh, Paul at gmail.com. Thank you. And, 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 and there's a price for that, and I, I think it's a very fair one given the time and expertise put in. For people who are, you know, a parent, et cetera, and they want the background, they can contact me at the, the same email address, um, alwyn.paul at gmail.com, and I'll make it available for them for free. Right. Um, that's very kind. For, for the, for the, for, that's okay. But for the schools that buy it, and, and there's a, a really good number of them now, um, they're not always the schools who, who are in that top level. For, for boards of trustees and for principals, it's actually a way of goal setting and it's actually a way also, it, as I've been discussing, but for looking and saying, okay, who's, who's succeeding? You know, who's doing an incredible job? How can we um, go and find out and, and um, how can we improve our situation? Um, and, and it's like if, you don't, if you're not identifying the problems, um, and, and a lot of schools don't know this stuff about themselves. Um, they don't know what their retention to 17 is. It's not focused on at a board meeting. Um, they, don't, they don't look at their results from a Lieber's perspective. You know, there's very school, few schools, I guess up until the data started to become available, very few schools who sit around at this time of the year and evaluate results and evaluate their pathways because they do that in February and March. Um, but this gives them a lot more information um, to consider and, and to plan on. Um, mm. and, and I think, that, you know, again, to, to, to kind of look at the reasons why, you know, clearly if we're taking, uh, we've got good reason here for no longer even considering that there's 100% or hard correlation between social economics and achievement in school, which is brilliant. Um, therefore, you've then got to look at other things and say, okay, is this, this is leadership quality. Um, this is teacher quality. Um, and, and between those two and your programming, you're looking at, at I guess, overall school quality. Um, you're looking at how are we engaging with our parents. Um, if you've got you know, a degree of kids not coming to school, you can actually sit down and have very honest conversations about about why not. Um, and when you say, well, you know, it's just too hard because of this and that, and you say, well, it's not too hard down the road. You know, they're all going to school down the road. Why aren't our kids coming to school? We need to sort this out. That's our job. And, and to me, that's the kind of really good space for the data to be in um, and, and look that way. So... Yeah, does that make sense? It does, and there's some problem within um, our education bureaucracy whereby, well, I would say that the school system sort of run for 
the politicians and the bureaucracy and the unions and it's not run for the students, the teachers and the principals. You know, that the power yeah, resides... Yeah, those, those the, yep. the power resides... I, I was going to say those... Con- sorry, sorry. No, no, but no, those no. conversations have, have been suppressed. And a, a part of it is this perception that we have pretty much had thrust upon us in New Zealand that, that any qualified teacher is, is the same as an, and as good as another teacher. Now, it's just not helpful because what it means is that, you know, you're struggling a bit as a teacher. You, you, oh, I'm not supposed to be struggling. So you don't go and, 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 and work actively at improving your quality um, and go, go and seek out those star teachers. And, and every adult knows that when they grew up, there was one or two teachers that really shone for them. Um, and we should be holding those people up and, and, and they should be, you know, um, it's interesting, again, it's, isn't it? It's, it's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Because yeah. um, those of us who were lucky had one or two teachers that turned us on and inspired us. Yeah. Sometimes um, I have a friend, a dear friend, who was turned on by a teacher and changed his life, and that teacher particularly didn't do it for me, if you know what I mean. And yeah. We also know from our kids that there are teachers that they greatly admire, work hard for, and teachers not. And they know the difference. The kids know. Yeah. Yeah, and and also, I mean, you then challenge the children uh, because, you know, at our schools, we say to our staff, you know, we need what I call a 300% model where you convince the staff that the success of the children depends 100% on them, you know, their qualities, their professionality, their care. Then you convince the children that their success depends 100% on their dedication, their ability to listen, um, their attitude, their approach, being next door, et cetera. And then you convince the parents that the success of their children and the success of their school depends 100% on them. And, and, and therefore, you know, when someone has a flat day, the other two groups pick it up. Um, and so for you, you know, I would have said to you, for this teacher that wasn't really working for you, I'd say, well, what well, about his mark at the end of the year, it's yours. Yes. And, you know, uh, he mightn't be uh, your favourite teacher, but I tell you what, and I used to do this um, when, particularly when I was teaching uh, at St. Cup, um, girls would come and they'd, they'd say, look, I'd like to do you to do your seven from economic class, but I don't have a prerequisite. And I'd go, it's okay, I, I, I can deal with that, but I need to know what your year 11 marks were, as opposed to year 12. And, and they'd go, okay. And so it, it might go through, and a, a child, let's say a child had 70, 70, 65, 62, 65 or something. I'd go, cool, you're in. Um, the ones that would bother me, the ones that had sort of 80, 75, 75, 70, 40. And I go, uh, what are you having with the 40? And they go, well, it teaches a bit of a dick. And I go, well, what if I am? Does that mean partway through the year you'll just give up? And, and so we'd have to have a pretty honest conversation about that. So that's talking to the kids about how much it depends on them. But certainly a good teacher is, is really helpful um, and a good teacher can actually as- inspire a child across their subject areas um, because, you know, they'll be a cheerleader in other subjects as well as for the work that the child's doing in their class. Mm. It's, that's, um, I just love that 300% model because it, 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 yeah. it, it puts the responsibility squarely with teacher, parent, student. Yeah, absolutely. That it's not all one way. Um, no. And, and, you know, people often think even, uh, I've mentioned Hattie a couple of times, but, uh, you know, his, his visible learning work, one of the things he sees as a very strong factor is, is, is feedback. And, of course, you immediately think that that's you as a teacher 
telling the child how they're doing. But potentially you as a teacher, uh, it's a two-way process and then a three-way process in terms of going to the parent. But it's you also observing and hearing and, and uh, you know, it can be as, as much as seeing confusion in a child's face and realising you've just gone too quickly with an explanation and things like that. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so the conference. Tell me about uh, the conference. So, yeah, um, what I looked to do, it, it took a long time to organise, was, was put in, in, in the one room, which happened to be at the Velodrome here in Cambridge, um, a, a range of uh, New Zealand educators or education interested people um, to really speak to the, the politicians about um, the best policy they can wrote, write, primarily for kids who are you know, at risk of missing out, so you can, that can be, so there's a little more loaded than DSL 1 to 4, um, so it can be that group, but there's also kids um, who have uh, difficulty with reading or we've got a huge, huge anxiety problem in our schools at the moment. Um, and and you know, a lot of these kids need different treatment, and, and I, I don't want to embarrass you, Rodney, but, well, I probably do, actually, um, you remember that you were at Mount Hobson once yes. and uh, we were sitting in the office talking through some things and there was a boy outside sweeping the path, a uh, boy called Alex, lovely kid, um, but as Asperger's as you get. And as he's sweeping the path, he looks through the window and he sees you sitting in the office. Um, and this was post Dancing with the Stars. And he put down his broom, stomped around, came through the door, through the foyer, looked at you and said, you're Rodney Hyde. And you replied, yes, yes, I am. He goes, you're a lot fatter than you look on TV. <laughs> <laughs> and just turned around and walked and walk straight back out. You know, nothing, no excuse, no apology. And... Um, I was rather non-plus. I was, I was rather non <laughs> because I always thought that TV was slimming, but the uh, was was fattening. Because whenever I see myself on TV, I always think, "Oh, I'm not that fat." <laughs> I remember that. Um, yeah, but see, there's a range of of kids, uh, for instance, who like that. I mean who cannot fit in what they've called a modern learning environment. And and, and and so you've got to have all of these different approaches. So Just before um, you move invited, on, just picking up on one thing. Yep. Tell me about this anxiety. Right. Um so this is this is well pre pre COVID as an issue. Um in New Zealand, uh in, in other places no doubt, um there are children for whom uh, going to school creates huge anxiety. Now, where um, that becomes habitual, uh, they can be kind of called school of earth. And y you have to have a, a really um, well thought through, and, and you don't succeed 100% either. You know, there are some kids for whom it's two or three times trying to overcome this hurdle. Um, where you've got conditions in place for them that lower their anxiety levels when they come into a school. And again, the, the examples I can have are closest to home, but um, we, in our schools, um, 15 in a class um, helps a great deal because um, they're not anxious about who they know and who they don't know. Obviously, the quality of your teachers and their ability to be positive and non-confrontational um, and um, a, a very predictable day, which works for everybody. You're not harming, uh, you know, a, a hard-working, confident, positive student by having a predictable day. In fact, you're probably giving them even more opportunity. Um, but the, a student with anxiety, um, if anyone has got kind of deep fear or, or concern, they're not going to learn in a classroom. And, and, and so you've got to have the conditions in place. Um, and, 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 you know, realise sometimes it's they come half a day at a time or 
They might come for two hours and then feel a little more confident, a little more confident. Certainly the COVID situation seems to have exacerbated it a great deal. Um, and that's why I'm so disappointed with the Education Select Committee um, and their investigation into absenteeism. Uh, and that they only had six schools submit and they didn't go out to schools and ask the schools and the students and the families why or why not are they going to school? Um, mm. and, and because you needed to know. I mean, how much of this is just sheer anxiety? How much of it and, is and school Has that quality? anxiety, and it goes back pre-COVID, has that been a, a growing thing? I, I, I think it has. And, and part of it is, um, like, we have um, altered the role for schools, you know, well beyond, I think, what they're suited to do in many cases. And also a lot of people um, in, in, in the media, in um, school environments, um, kind of pressure groups, political pressure groups, uh, etc. you know, they just throw stuff at kids. You know, the world's going to end in 10 years. And, oh, yes. Um, you know, every, everyone's going to die from COVID or monkeypox or... Um, uh, you know, there's going to be a war in the Pacific, and, and and as adults, we struggle to deal with that. As kids, well, it's just a nightmare. It is a um, nightmare. It and, is a, and, it yeah, is a nightmare. Yeah, and, and our generation, Rodney, it was it was sort of the, the Cold War. Yes. Um, but I, I I can remember how fearful and and you know that was. Um, and adults have got to do a lot of thinking about the crap that they just spray around. Um, because they spray and walk away, and, and the kids have to tidy it up. The poor little kids, um, you know, that's so. what, that, that's, um, as you know, we were, had our three kids in schools at Christchurch, and it was um, the fear about an earthquake, you know, uh, it went on and on and on and yep. on. Then we had the terrorist attack, on and on and on and on and on. Then they had a, a, yeah. a paedophile that was released into the district. They went on and on and on and on and on to the kids about, you know, earthquakes, um, <laughs> earthquakes, paedophiles, and the terror attack, you know, someone could come with a gun. And then we had bloody COVID. And then on top of that, <laughs> then on top of yeah. that, you know, everyone's getting lectured to about climate change and you've got to save the planet. And um, and then suddenly you could get COVID and kill Nana or you could stay two metres away. And that's when we just <laughs> left the school and homeschooled because I thought to myself, yeah. this is this is terrorising the poor cats. Yeah, it's not, it's not going to seem connected. It got, um, but but I'll, I'll get there. Um, I, I think... For those who saw it, the 9-11 terrorist attack induced um, post-traumatic stress disorder, I think, throughout the world. Yes. And, you know, I, I've been to the memorial over there three times and, um, you know, I, I've studied it and I've read what psychologists said. And, and, and some of the most interesting stuff was with the people going, hey, that event happened... It was real. We we don't you don't hide from that, although you may shield children from some of the details, you know. Um, but but what they said was really most trauma inducing was that the um, planes crashing into the buildings and the buildings coming down was repeated again and again and again and yes. again and again and again. And so, therefore, you weren't seeing that as it was in the real world, which was uh, an almost instantaneous experience or an experience over two hours and obviously uh, prolonged recovery. You you saw, I don't know, you probably could have seen it a thousand times if you had been oh, fixated with the media. Oh, easily. And, 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 and I think that's, that's, again, the things you've mentioned, some of those are real. And and the things that kids will know have happened, 
but it's the re- repetition and the pessim- pessimism and all of that associated and with it. And so many, uh, Yeah. And absolutely. historically, and, and, historically, parents and schools have worked very hard, even in anxious times, such as depressions and World War II, yeah. to preserve a child's innocence so they can have a proper childhood. Correct. Yeah, And we now have yeah. this view that kids at primary school should know all about the world's problems and at sort of nine years old. Yeah, and, and we've also forgotten, and I, I don't, this isn't trivial, it's, it's very important, that, you know, the prayer that let me know the things that I can change. Yes. <laughs> and, and let me leave aside the things, I, I'm paraphrasing, but let me leave aside the things that I can't. Um, you I know, think so I, can get I, on. I keep thinking back to that wonderful movie, I think it was called A Beautiful Life, where oh, yeah. the man with yeah, his yeah. son was in a yeah. concentration camp and pretended yeah. to his son what that it was a holiday or that it was a fun place. And of course that Correct. is a parent's that is a parent's um objective is to let a child oh. play and grow free from adult yep. fears. Yeah. And develop. Yeah, it, it, look, and you can take this even right through to, you know, I, I, I've coached, you know, Chris 15 rugby and things like that. I, I, I think there's a lot around the upper levels of even secondary school sport now where the school is far more focused on the school and, and their results that year than they are the development of the child um, into sort of um, further sporting uh, development uh, into making sure that their academics are also up to yes. scratch and um, things like that. And so it's not it's not just located in your primary schools either. I mean, there's a lot of pressure that doesn't deserve to be placed on a young person. No. I'm talking so, with so Al, I'm conference. talking with Alwyn yeah. Paul. Um, he's an educationist. He's run schools. He's set up co- schools. He's very experienced. He's looked at the data that the ministry provide. You can contact him at alwyn.paul at gmail.com. It's P-O-O-L-E. Now, Alwyn, tell us about yep. the policy conclusions. Sure. So we, we I put together, you know, and, and very grateful to the people who turned up, uh, invited uh, Erica Stanford from National as a spokesperson, Chris Bailey from ACT, also invited Jan Tanetti, who declined, and the Green Party, uh, who just didn't bother replying. Um, so, <laughs> so Erica and Chris uh, were there for the two days, and the sort of people that we had talk, I'll, I'll, I'll re- read you the list, really, because um, I, I think you, you, you'll love who turned up. I can't, I can't speak for them. I know that some will, will make available their... Um, presentations. Um, I just haven't got all those permissions yet, but I can speak about some of the general things that came through. So we had two ladies uh, who opened the mornings. Uh, one's a lady called Sandy Geyer, who has written a remarkable book called Path of the Lion. And she talked about uh, self-leadership and, and she changed the room and, and she certainly uh, changed and challenged you know, my views about the way that we treat leadership in schools. She was brilliant. And then uh, Kate Morton, who um, works in the sort of business and personal mentor framework, but also tells her story from being an extraordinary student uh, at St. Cuthbert's and through university, um, to then having to work out um, how being just so on the go had to be balanced up with with other things. Otherwise, you know, she wasn't going to last very long. Um, we had Greg Newbold, the criminologist, uh, who is retired out of Canterbury University, so it, it wasn't a tame room. Um, man called Lance Norman, who works for in and around Waipareda Trust. Um, Linda Vagana from uh, Duffy Books and Homes. 
uh, James Bentley and Kieran Fui, who have both been leaders of St. Peter's Epsom and Kieran Lace League St. Paul's, uh, and Ponsonby, who I would say are two of the outstanding schools. And they spoke to, as you'll look through the data, you'll see the remarkable success of many of the Catholic schools. Yes. And, and as I said, the one, one I've highlighted in, in a little article so far is uh, Macaulay. So, so Karen spoke to us about the things that he thinks is causing that, but also with humility. He said, look, you know, we've still got a long way to go, and there are still schools to, to work their way up. We had Professor Elizabeth Rata from University of Auckland, uh, and she was simply extraordinary at looking at the difference between socio-cultural uh, knowledge and academic knowledge and where they're placed and and. Um, without devaluing either of them. I thought she did an extraordinary presentation, and I do know she's happy for her to be first to be shared, um, and, and I'll work on it. Um, Susan Warren from an organisation called Comet, um, that does a lot of very good work uh, in Auckland, and, and particularly towards South Auckland. Um, Rob Gilbert, who is uh, um, one of the leading team at Taronga Boys College, um, we have Dame Wendy Pye uh, from Sunshine Books, and she is a force of nature. Um, but again, she she simply explained the quality and the why of of one of the new series that she's put out um, called Decodable Readers. And you know, there's a lot of stuff around early um, literacy. And uh, uh, to be honest, she she just provided very very good solutions. Um, another person who's who's path uh, to her doorway should be cluttered yes. uh, with with our bureaucrats. So uh, John Hattie is contributing. He's travelling the US at the moment, but he's sending through a recording. Uh, I had a little bit to say. Um, we had Syra Boyle and Catherine Pick, who are the leaders of the Mount Hobson Academy, and are providing an incredibly successful online. Um, opportunity for families. Uh, Nathan Wallace, um, who uh, does incredible work for um, parenting, really, of, of, of younger children and of brain development and human development, and he works on, on our First Thousand Days program, which includes the child's time within the womb. And, and again, he explained and presented his work so very, very clearly. Um, we had Nick Hyde, who founded Vanguard School, um, and uh, they do great work, uh, again, sort of as a very high-quality, almost second-chance option. Um, Dr. Michael Johnson, uh, who's recently out of Victoria University, who uh, is now at the New Zealand Initiative, and he, again, talked about the work that can be done to improve our literacy. And Nathan Jury. Um, who runs Manakura in Palmerston North um, and founded that. He told the story of that and told why they are being so very successful. And Ala Chu from Maxim, and she summarised and, and, and did a great job. Um, on the on the Monday night, we, we had um, actually a dinner here in Cambridge and we had Mahi Drysdale uh, and uh, Michael Brake, who also is an Olympic gold medalist, and, um, you know, they talked to some of their achievements and, and I have to say it was a lot of fun as well. Um, what came out of it is, I guess, um, first of all, is, is significant optimism, uh, which wasn't necessarily going to be the outcome. Um, and, and we said right at the start, this isn't an echo chamber. You know, let's, let's really smash ideas around. Um, and, and, and that happened, which which made it superb. People were very pleased with the event. Um, certainly the, 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 the need to transform the way that we parent um, from the first moment that a lady knows that she's pregnant through to those first three to five years um, was identified as being absolutely crucial. Um, and, and I think, as I said to Erica, hey, you know, it might take some time to alter our system. Don't forget that the kids who are in year 13 this year are important and next year and next year. But you know what we can do while we're, while we're lifting our system 
we can quite quickly become the best country in the world for parenting by simply applying what we've learned over the last 20 years through neuroscience and human development. So uh, that came out, the, the emphasis on changing some practices with literacy, um, but I also think the importance of different provisions um, you know, being available. Uh, and in some areas, like South Auckland, there are very few. And I think, as I said last time, our South Auckland middle school graduates go into four schools, Maiarewa High, James Cook, Alfreston or Papakura, uh, that are by and large operating in pretty much the same way and, and not always successfully. Um, so they don't have an option. And creating those other options, I think, is a, a very important thing that came out of it. What else, Alwyn? Um, I think it was, again, looking at um, good practice. Like To hear someone like, uh, you know, at the beginning of our talk, we were looking at the um, fact that some DSI-01 schools are doing extraordinarily well. And... Um, and saying, well, in a sense, that's a social surprise because we've been told ad nauseum that they can't because the kids are poor and the family's not interested in all that sort of stuff. Um, there's a little bit there, I, I see provocatively, but we hold it, actually, that as a country, we clearly um, aren't desperate to change a lot of these results, so therefore we must assume that, that we're thinking that Māori and Pacific children are, are less able than Asian and European children. Mm. Not for the life of me, don't believe that. But when we tolerate a system that produces UE for Māori at 19% and for Asian student at 67% of leaders, and we're not bothered by it, it must be that, again, as you use, that we've been fatalistic. Well, you know, maybe that's just where they stand. Um, and I a little bit racist. Norming, oh, massively. Absolutely, and, and I think, it, I can't remember who it was, it was a, a president said it, but it was a speechwriter who did it where he talked about the uh, um, soft prejudice of, of low expectations. And to hear someone like Nathan Jury um, just talk about the success of their children, that it's hard earned, you know, I mean, they, they put a, a heap of work in. Um, to hear Karen Fui talk about the work at St. Paul's in, in Ponsonby, which is a decile two school, uh, um, pretty much all uh, Pacifica, and and they're right up there. You know, they're yes. sort of in um, the high 80s now. I'm very sorry, Alwyn. I'm talking with Alwyn Paul. You can contact yep. him at alwyn.paul at gmail.com, and it's P double O L E. Your data is the cause for amazing optimism. I'm going to have yes. to cut to the news, but I'm going to have you back when I'm next on um, because education is so important. You are showing what can be... There are schools showing us what can be done. Correct. And we have to learn from them. And we can transform young people's lives if we have the will. Absolutely. And I think that's what we closed with Eric and Chris and said, look, hey, it, it, it lead. You know, I think that's so important. Bring the political will to the situation. Okay. Look around the room. Like I've got people. to kill it there, Owen. Thank you so much. We're going to